Hey everybody, welcome back. And as you can see, the studio is coming along really quick. This is the sixth part of my series of turning a tough shed right here into a YouTube recording studio kitchen. Let's go on in so I can show you what we've done since the last video. Every part in this video was unbelievably irritating to do. These last few weeks have given me even more respect for people in the trades. The first thing I had to tackle was the drywall. Like everything else in this build, I had no idea what I was doing before I started this. In my case, I was actually even worse off because I can't measure for shit. Anyway, you know the old saying, measure twice and cut once? Well, I measured six times and cut once. And still, I managed to mess it up almost as much as I did it right. The outside dimensions of the studio are 12 by 16. So the first thing I learned about drywall was to avoid butt joints if possible. And that means getting drywall sheets that are large enough to be able to span the entire width of the studio. That way, most of the joints on the drywall are those factory flat joints that already have an indention in them so you can put tape and mud in them and stuff like that and they still end up flat so if you know anything about drywall you know that flat joints are better than butt joints because with butt joints you have to fan that joint out super wide so you can't see the bump on the wall that means you have a little tiny seam where the pieces of drywall meet but the joint is actually four or five feet long so the way i managed to arrange all of my drywall i only had four butt joints on the entire build better yet Two of those joints are gonna be behind cabinets so you wouldn't see them anyway. That doesn't mean I don't wanna do them really good, it just means that when I inevitably screw them up, you won't be able to see them and I can just pretend I was awesome. Which everybody watching knows, not so much. Anyway, the pieces of drywall are about 70 pounds each and I'm doing most of this job by myself. So I needed to buy something called a drywall lift, which is what that yellow machine is you see floating around in here. That thing was transformative. Not only could I do the ceilings with it, but I kind of figured out a way to do the walls with it also. You'd be surprised at how few screws you really need to put into a piece of drywall to get it to stay put while you're putting the rest of them in. Every time I let go of that thing, I was expecting the whole thing to come crashing down, but it didn't, so yay. Also, I was a little bit concerned about the ceiling joists that I put in because I've never done this before. And all of my instruction for doing all of these things have come from watching YouTube videos. The first two pieces of drywall that I put up on that ceiling, I was really expecting the whole thing to come crashing down. And then my studio dreams would go crashing down along with it. But you can see right there, that didn't happen. And that's a miracle. For the most part, most of that drywall installation went pretty easy. You just have to make note of how long your pieces of drywall are and where your studs are. You want each piece of drywall to end sort of right in the middle of one of those studs so you have something to screw it into. So measurement really does become key. Also, you need to make good measurements as to where exactly all your electrical boxes and stuff are. I made notations and arrows on the walls just to mark the locations of those things. So when I put the drywall up, I know exactly where to cut my holes with my roto zip in order to get that nice and tight around those receptacles. If you're looking really closely, you can see that it wasn't always nice and tight. In fact, some of these holes that I cut were god awful. The good thing is it's drywall, so no matter what you do, you can always fix it and cover it up with a whole bunch of mud and nobody will ever know. Except for you and anybody else who watches this video on YouTube. Kind of makes me want to delete the video. Wow, that was a nice image. Deleted. Anyway, the most challenging part of the drywall for me was cutting the shape out of a single piece of drywall to hang over the door. I didn't want to have too many joints around the door because as far as stuff that I've seen, that tends to be where you get cracking and stuff like that. And I was kind of trying to avoid that as much as possible. So I guessed really good on my measurements and got that thing lifted up there. Somehow with the drywall lift, in a way it's not really designed to do, but what the heck, it got up, didn't it? Nobody died yet. After the drywall was finished, I moved on to mudding and taping. The first thing I did was pre-fill all my big boo-boos with that 90 minute stuff. And at the same time, I applied a bunch of nylon patches to areas that I lost control of my roto zip on. Got all those set and moved on to the actual mudding and taping. That part went really, really well, and it's actually one of the parts that I thought it was gonna be the hardest for me to do. I heard a lot of horror stories about people getting bubbles on the tape and then having to cut tape out and redo stuff, bubbles in the mud, chunks of whatever getting in there, you know, so on and so forth. So for this part, I watched an awful lot of videos from the Vancouver Carpenter and also Renovision DIY's YouTube channel. Those guys are amazing teachers and they're really easy to follow. 
So if you ever wanted to learn how to do something like this, I really recommend watching some of those guys' content. So as far as taping goes, you have to tape every patch, every seam, and every corner in every direction. You want to make sure that you don't really have any areas where there's open pieces of drywall because it seems like that's where your cracks are going to start. So the whole process for me was putting down some mud, taping over the top of the mud, putting a little bit more mud over the top of the tape and then scraping that off just to get the tape nice and moist, letting all that dry and then using alternating days to mud over that tape over and over again until you have a nice flat surface. As far as the butt joints that I was talking about before, you can tell which ones those are on the wall because those aren't little skinny lines it looks like there's an entire section of wall that's been mudded over and that's kind of where those joints are because those were pretty big as a total novice I had to stretch those out pretty far otherwise you would definitely be able to see them after that I sanded the entire surface down and then I put down what's called a skim coat basically what you're doing with the skim coat is you're putting a layer of drywall mud over the entire surface of all of the walls and ceiling inside your project once you've put that on, you're skimming it off nice and flat as possible. You want to try to keep that as neat as you can because you want to minimize the amount of sanding that you have to do on it. And the reasoning behind it is because now your walls are going to have one single surface. The main reason you'd go through all this trouble is that the drywall mud and the drywall itself are going to have different textures. If you put a skim coat over the entire thing, you're effectively making the entire surface the same texture. And therefore, when you paint, you can't see the taping lines in your walls anymore. And I guarantee you, if you go look at one of the walls in your house, if you look hard enough, you can definitely see those lines unless you paid for something called a level five finish. Typically, if you texture your walls, it'll hide a lot of stuff, but I wanted to go with smooth walls and a smooth ceiling. So therefore, every tiny little mistake is gonna show up. Because of that, I had to be really meticulous. And to be totally honest, there's quite a few mistakes on this that I wasn't super happy about. But a lot of those are in areas that are gonna be covered up by other things anyway. So hopefully it's not gonna to be too noticeable whenever we get done. After I had all the drywall mud done and it was hard and I figured I'd just go ahead and install all of the receptacles. They're all wired up and working, but they were all hanging out of the wall. I just went ahead and screwed them in just to get them out of the way because I figured I was gonna end up hitting them with the brush or the roller over and over again, which I still ended up doing a lot anyway, but a lot less. After the skim coat was done, there was a, another round of sanding, and then it was time to apply primer. I bought the top of the line bear paints from Home Depot, which are the Dynasty and the Marquee brands. And those say they're paint and primer both. But as far as what I've read, you're way better off putting a real coat of primer down instead of relying on that with the paint. So I primed the entire surface, did a prime check with a flashlight and tried to pick out all the mistakes that I made so I could smooth those out and reprime them. And once I was satisfied that that was all good, AKA got tired of doing it, then I moved on to doing the ceiling. By the way, if this is your first time here and you want to learn some cool new recipes, get some great cooking tips and tricks and all sorts of other kitchen related things, then start now by subscribing to the channel and clicking the notification bell so you never miss a thing. The ceiling paint I used was the Bear Marquee Ultra Flat White. I did all my cutting first, which really wasn't all that bad because you don't really have to be too careful about getting stuff onto your actual walls since we haven't painted those yet anyway. And after the cutting, I rolled on the paint. I did two coats of paint on the ceiling making sure that I was always rolling the roller in the same direction. That way the texture that the roller leaves up on the ceiling is always the same. And it minimizes the ability to see any kind of roller marks or anything else that's ugly up on your ceiling. Because you know what, that's right in front of your face and you can't really hide it, so it better look good, right? After the ceiling was done, I was able to move on to the walls. The paint color that I chose for the walls is called Deep River. That's also a bear paint, but it's their Dynasty brand. Dynasty is the most expensive of all the bear paints, but really the main thing was I liked the color so much that I was gonna buy that anyway. It's supposed to be single coat coverage, but I did do two coats over the entire studio anyway. And I'll tell you what, that second coat really does make the color look a lot more rich. So if you're debating whether to do one or two coats of paint, I would just go ahead and do two. That also gives you a chance to make sure you get any spots that might've got missed and you don't have any little speckles of white drywall poking through anywhere where the paint didn't quite saturate. I used frog tape to tape off the ceiling. And I'll tell you what, 
That stuff did an absolutely awesome job at keeping that blue from seeping into the white in the ceiling. In fact, I only got a little bit of blue on the ceiling here and there, and that's only because I wasn't coordinated with the roller and managed to hit the ceiling a couple of times and probably hit it a couple of times with the brush too when I was cutting. And even one time I almost walked off the edge of the platform and ended up putting a big blue streak in the ceiling. Here's a quick update of what we got going on on the inside. You can see I have a lot of these receptacle covers done. Right here, we got some parts for the plumbing and the sink fixtures. There's a pot rack that's gonna be going up right here. This is my Z-Line range hood that is going right here and we're just about ready to install that. And make up our system right there. There's the bracket for the chandelier, which is right here. That's gonna look really cool when it's up. There's the wiring for the peninsula, all my video cables for the cameras. And there's one of my camera mounts right there. There's a mistake I made with the drywall. That was really irritating since that was the last plate I put in the wall. It's the only one that doesn't cover. Anyway, I got an oversized plate coming and it's gonna cover that hole up nicely. Electrical panel, all done. And then right up here, we have our smoke alarm with an Alexa in it. Alexa, say hi. Hello. That was just about all the super messy stuff left. What's coming now is the ultra expensive stuff, like the cabinets, the appliances, the air conditioning, you know, the stuff that makes it a kitchen. Also in the next video, I think I'm gonna put an update to the total cost of this entire job so far as well. It's creeping up a lot higher than it was last time you saw it. Anyway, if you like this video, you might like to check out our playlist right here where we have the entire history of the construction of the YouTube studio from the Tough Shed. That's interesting to see, especially when you see how much I'm fumbling around at the very beginning. If anything, this has definitely been a transformative experience for me. Well, that's it for now. I hope to see you back again here really soon. And until that time, I'm Joe and I hope you have a phenomenal day. Take it easy.